Even though some allege that the Articles of Confederation was a failed governmental model that invited universal criticism, the Annapolis Convention of 1786 proved that not everyone was ready to radically alter the Confederation system. In this video, I'll explain. By the mid-1780s, those that favored augmenting the power of the central government had plenty of gripes about the Articles of Confederation. Most of these complaints came down to a few overarching claims, all of which were routinely espoused by nationalist politicians. First, the contention that the Confederation government had no real power of taxation, being forced to rely on requisitions, formal requests for money, from the state authorities. Second, the view that without central control of the militia forces, state governments would be continually threatened by rebellions and interests hostile to the Republican governments in the states. Third, the observation that the states had levied various barriers that restricted trade with other states, such as protective tariffs and paper money laws. In 1780, Alexander Hamilton wrote that the Confederation itself is defective and requires to be altered. It is neither fit for war nor peace. According to Pennsylvanian Samuel Bryan, it had become the universal wish of America to grant further powers to Congress, so as to make the federal government adequate to the ends of its institution. Even Thomas Treadwell of New York, a future opponent of the Constitution who favored federalism, argued that the federal government is not adequate to the purpose of the Union. Even though the Mount Vernon Compact of 1785 had ended some disputes between the states regarding navigation on waterways, many believed that there was much more to be done. In a candid attempt to bring delegates from all the states together to discuss constitutional reforms that would rectify some of the most prevalent qualms, Alexander Hamilton played a key role in organizing the Annapolis Convention of 1786. James Madison, who also played a pivotal role in the convention, hoped the gathering would help address what he called the defects of the Confederation. Throughout 1786, Madison immersed himself in a massive research project, where he poured time into the study of ancient confederacies and republics. In this pursuit, his goal was to prescribe remedies to the Confederation system under the Articles of Confederation. Ultimately, Madison came to the conclusion that classic confederations often suffered from governmental weakness in the center and squabbles over the division of powers. As a famous pamphleteer later wrote, by this time the Nationalists had not envisioned a mere revision and amendment of our first confederation, but a complete system for the future government of the United States. On September 11, 1786, 12 delegates from five states, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Virginia, arrived at George Mann's Tavern in Annapolis, Maryland. The meeting of commissioners to remedy defects of the federal government, more commonly known as the Annapolis Convention of 1786, lasted four days. By the end of deliberations, a set of resolutions was passed by the convention, which expressed the following sentiments. One, that a future meeting of state delegates from all states was necessary to confront the challenges of the Confederation framework, lest the array of issues grow to be, quote, greater and more numerous. Two, that delegates to a future meeting of the states should be granted enlarged powers to discuss all topics rather than trade alone. Three, that the new proposed meeting of the states should take place the next year in Philadelphia on the second Monday in May to mull the necessary reforms. Unfortunately for Hamilton and Madison, the Annapolis Convention proved to be a relative failure. This was because of several factors, all of which worked against the aims of the Nationalists. First, the immensely popular George Washington was not present at the Annapolis Convention, despite his opinion that the Confederation was a half-starved, limping government. At this point, Washington professed that his days in politics were over, and expressed his wish to remain retired at Mount Vernon. Second, the Annapolis Convention faced inaction and obstruction from the states. North Carolina, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island all appointed delegates, but all of them failed to arrive in Annapolis for the convention. In addition, South Carolina, Maryland, Georgia, and Connecticut refused to elect delegates or take any action to support the aims of the convention at all. With only five states in attendance, the convention carried little weight or influence. Third, most of the delegates from the states that were in attendance were only authorized to discuss issues relating to trade among the states. Because the delegates were bound to these instructions from their home governments, the potential for reform was highly limited from the outset. 
Despite the Annapolis Convention's shortcomings, the call for a future convention in Philadelphia panned out. As the cause for reforming the Confederation system grew more popular the next year, 12 states sent delegates to the Philadelphia Convention of 1787, which produced a new constitutional framework. In my book, Compact to the Republic, I explained how the Annapolis Convention of 1786 inspired the states to produce a plan for a brand new constitutional framework. I'll include a link to that below in the notes, and I appreciate it if you pick up a copy. I'll also include links on the best works on the Annapolis Convention of 1786. Thank you for watching this episode of History in a Nutshell. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel, click the bell to be notified when I post updates, and check out my other videos.